Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a PBA coffee break. We're very excited to have with us Dr. Lisa Crossley from Relic Health Technologies today. Lisa presented at our PBA Sankas set just last week, September 26th, and there were so many questions that we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring her back and answer a couple of those questions for, uh, for you who may have not been there and for our attendees who we didn't have a chance to answer. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me again, Sophie. No problem. We love it. Um, so let's start with some of the questions that we had. Um, one of them was, um, where do you stand currently with a data soft logic? Um, there was some initial news of patients yes. coming on. Um, so, you know, has there been room to enhance that relationship? And if you can give us an overview. Yeah, we've been moving forward with them as we have with kind of all of the contracts that we've announced. I would say um, some of the contracts obviously go faster than others, and you don't know who is going to be the faster moving one until you get going. But um, overall, that really doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but they've been moving well. Um, and in terms of enhancing that relationship, I mean, our expectation generally working with any of these clients is that, um, you know, we'll continue to expand as they expand. Uh, you know, with some of them, we start off with a, a small group. So for example, with an ACO network, we might start with just one ACO and then expand from there. And uh, with DataSoft Logic, you know, we're kind of expanding through their entire doctor population. So, you know, certainly we expect that relationship and that the patients associated with that relationship to um, grow as time goes forward. So. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, contracts that have been signed uh, across the board. Um, and so what does that look like in terms of, um, I guess, uh, revenues that that'll bring in by the end of 2024? So we expect to end 2024 at a revenue run rate of about 100 million. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we've talked about this before, uh, quite a few times, but our clients tend to deploy in a phased rollout approach. So revenues tend to be backloaded, but I think we're pretty comfortable that we'll be at our target gross margins of over 70%, EBITDA margins of over 40% uh, at that revenue run rate of roughly 100 million a year by the end of 2024. Okay, excellent. Um, so have any of those contracts been canceled? And if so, no. <laughs> No, no, we haven't had any uh, customer attrition, any contracts canceled. Um, you know, we've very early on, we canceled one or two contracts with uh, customers who, you know, we felt maybe didn't uh, have the same attitude towards Medicare and Medicaid compliance that we did. Um, but we haven't since had any contract cancellations. Well, that's excellent news. And that speaks to your product offering that, you know, yes. the customers. Um, so the oncology clinical trials, are those getting any traction? They are, you know, the tricky thing with cl clinical trials in terms of kind of building a business around them is that they tend to be relatively small numbers of patients. So, you know, we do, uh, we are active in the oncology clinical trial space, but I think the bulk of our patients are certainly going to come from the more traditional sectors of skilled nursing, home health, primary care, uh, long-term care hospice care. Yeah. Excellent. So, so far you have SNFs, RHCs, physician practices, home oh. care agencies, pain yeah. kit clinics, assisted living, um, uh, I'm just right, pediatric and diabetes. Are, uh, are you missing anyone in the space? Because it seems like you have everything covered. I mean, we tend to be pretty opportunistic in terms of as Medicare and Medicaid roll out new billing codes, then we will expand our platform. We can very quickly and easily spin up a new module that will address the new billing code. And then we target those customers. As I have said before, a lot of our customers come to us through referrals. So sometimes we won't necessarily realize that there's a, an actual place for us in, say, hospice care. And then we'll get a client who comes to us and explains, you know, exactly what they'd like us to do. And it, it fits in perfectly with what the platform's already designed to do. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, we've certainly, I think, covered most of the ecosystem in terms of virtual care for chronic disease patients. Uh, but I'm 
frequently surprised by new areas where our platform apparently has applications. So I think we'll certainly see some, some new applications for the technology as we go forward. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, so you have, uh, how's the relationship with the uh, Cognizant group going? Yeah. Are they happy with the progress? Um, and what are their expectations for the upcoming year? Yeah, so Cognizant uh, right now works very closely with us on care management, and we also do joint sales calls. So, um, and I will say that there has uh, some of the large contracts that we've announced have come to us through introductions from Cognizant. So the relationship's been very beneficial for us. And on their side, you know, their expectation is that we'll continue to grow and use more of their care management services because that's very cost effective for us and allows us to scale very quickly. And it certainly is something that relationship, particularly around the care management piece, is something that makes our larger clients very comfortable and uh, that we'll, we'll be able to scale to their requirements. So I think the relationship's proceeding well and certainly expect it to continue to expand um, as we move into 2024 and beyond. Excellent. So now the big question, Lisa. Okay. Um, you recently announced a $4 million uh, financing, and then you upsized it to $6 million um, due to demand, which is great. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, first, primarily why you're doing this raise, and then um, if you can just let uh, you know our viewers know that the, the conditions of the raise, the, the offering. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so just very briefly say the, the offering was um, originally, as you say, 4 million, upsized to six. It's a, a 40 cent unit and a 52 cent warrant for each unit. And the warrants expire after two and a half years. Um, we did the raise, you know, the uh, PI Financial brought us essentially a full book um, for the 4 million that was basically made up um, almost entirely just by three U.S. funds, an international fund, and then a, a Canadian fund who previously participated and uh, re-upped as well. Um, so for us, having those U.S. funds in particular, as well as the international fund, that diversification outside of Canada, given that our customer base is primarily in the U.S., almost exclusively in the U.S., uh, made a lot of sense. Bringing in the funds in large positions as well also helps with and the volatility around a, a stock that is entirely retail based, uh, you know, over the long term, that's certainly something we expect will shift that will get more of an institutional uh, investor base uh, versus just strictly retail. Um, and that that is the kind of thing those tend to be the longer term investors. Um, and being US funds that are very active in the healthcare space, they have a really good network that will help us with uh, continued business development. And, you know, as we prepare to move uh, to the NASDAQ to do our uplisting at some point in 2024, and they'll have really good contacts that will help us with that uh, initiative and support the stock once we are on the U.S. exchange. Um, but the reason that we, we did the raise um, at all was because we've signed more of these large contracts in the last few months than we'd ever actually anticipated. I mean, we certainly knew we were working with these large groups, but they've been signing on uh, faster than we'd expected. And in fact, the one we announced most recently with the physician network that has 300 locations across the U.S., they came to us, uh, you know, very, very recently and then very quickly signed on and immediately wanted to get moving. So given the fact that we're now deploying in 16 states plus Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands and Mexico, we're spread pretty thin and we really didn't have the capacity to expand and actually have people in each of those states who can get the customers up and running. It's a, a temporary sort of placement of staff where we have trainers who go in and, and train the personnel on site at the given client site, whatever that may be. And But if we want to service these large clients and if we want to keep them happy, and I think we can all agree we very much do, um, and we want to show them that we really can scale very quickly, and um, this infusion of cash is important, and we expect that it's going to add significantly to our bottom line and, and top line for next year. So, you know, in the end, I, I expect that our valuation will be significantly higher next year, even with uh, the dilution, I think the share price will be higher than it would have been, and even with the smaller number of shares, if we hadn't taken this cash now. So I think overall, it's a very good return for investors, and, and it was without a doubt the best thing for the company. So we've always said 
our philosophy as a management team and board is we are creating long-term value for this company. And, you know, this is definitely something that will significantly enhance the long-term value of the company. And so I think it was, it was definitely the best decision for the company now. Well, that's excellent. As a shareholder, I like to hear that. So thank you very much. Um, so Lisa, I think that basically wraps it up. So thank you again so much for joining us and, you know, best of luck. And we hope to hear from you again soon. Yes, always my pleasure. Thanks so much again, Sophie. Thank you.